Okay, does that work? Yeah, seems to. Okay, so hi everybody, welcome to this mini symposium in a maxi auditorium. Thanks for gathering around here, it helps a lot. Uh, so this uh, mini symposium, one of the basically last sessions before the closing session also in this auditorium, is about Earth system modeling, which is traditionally used for climate research. So coupled models of Earth's atmosphere and several other components of the uh, Earth system, but is more and more used also in, uh, in weather prediction uh, due to uh, availability of uh, improved models and also uh, HPC resources, and it, but it's still uh, for both climate and weather, it's really a huge uh, challenge with respect to HPC uh, associated with this, uh, with this Earth system modeling. Uh, due to some uh, logistics hiccup, I'm sharing this session and I'm also giving the first presentation, which then uh, at the same time the first slides will be given kind of overview introduction to, to, the, to the subject. So, so I guess I have to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Joachim Bierkamp from the German Climate Computing Center where I'm heading the application department. And so switch to my presentation. Start the timer. Uh, which is... Uh, about uh, activities around enabling this very high resolution uh, Earth system modeling in Europe, especially we have the center EasyWays, but a lot of other uh, things are going on. Um, so this slide I stole from Peter Bauer, who showed it last week at the supercomputing conference in Frankfurt. Uh, the animation does not run, but I have another one later. And so it was one of Peter's last slides uh, saying, if we could only do this, this is a, a resolution with 2.5 kilometer um, resolution, cloud permitting uh, in the tropical Atlantic, done at our institution in Hamburg at DKZ. That's why I feel free to show that here. Uh, and Peter said, if you could only do this uh, globally, not only regional, at one kilometer, not only 2.5, fully coupled, not only at atmosphere, and then the very important uh, thing is fast enough. And uh, in this presentation, I would allude to uh, why would we want to do that, why we can't do that today, what we can do today, and a bit on future perspectives, what we plan today. So typically, each talk about uh, climate science, especially if you want to uh, justify uh, a uh, strong, uh, strong uh, uh, financial request to your funding agency starts with one of these uh, images showing some kind of severe weather. I should, took this one because last week when I came back from this uh, conference where Peter showed his slide and presented his wish, uh, I had to travel for 24 hours instead of three because of very severe weather conditions. Uh, railway system in northern Germany broke completely down. People had to sleep in, uh, in trains on the, on the stations. I was lucky to get a hotel. So obviously what society wants is really a, a sound uh, warning or sound uh, um, understanding of how these extreme events may, may evolve in, the, uh, in a changing climate. And uh, I mean, we still uh, cannot be 100% sure that uh, Donald Trump isn't wrong, so the climate may change after all, and so we are trying to look into this. So how does uh, changing climate affect uh, weather extremes, the pattern effect weather extremes, the nature of weather extremes? Uh, why is it so possible? Uh, one of, one of one, uh, the, the um, difficulties in, in doing these kinds of things is associated with clouds. This is a slide I took from Bjorn Stevens, and what he demonstrates here is he shows the, the Earth as, as we know it on the left side, and all our climate models, Earth system models, are really tuned to simulate the weather and climate pattern, so the, the, yeah, the, the, um, the nature of climate on a real Earth, just uh, as a thought experiment, or as a, as a no, not a thought, but in, in, in an artificial experiment in uh, uh, he took uh, the same models and used it on Earth without continents and slightly uh, and not tilted to so the x-axis in, in another direction. 
And uh, basically what comes out is that the models completely disagree on where it rains, how much it rains. So the models are tuned not really to the physics, but to the conditions how our work looks. So and if every, something changes, can we be sure to really get clouds and precipitation right? And so this here shows all the processes which are or several scales which are involved in, in cloud and precipitation uh, processes. And uh, usually, if we have a very, very low resolution or standard resolution climate models, these things have to be parameterized, not directly, are not directly resolved. And so the hope is that we can go down to a one kilometer resolution. Uh, we might get much better at least in, uh, in precipitation. And uh, if we go even be below at 100 meters or so, and the next speakers, speakers can explain that, that much better than I can, uh, uh, is how Bjorn Stevens again calls it here, this would break in the cloud dead lag. But uh, what I'm concentrating here is uh, this first part, because this one kilometer range is something we might hope for, that we can achieve that. 100 meter on a global scale is I don't know, quantum computing, maybe not the right answer, but we do not know what the answer is and if this ever will be possible. So the, uh, the challenge, we need global coupled models. We want to have a resolution of at least one kilometer globally, and uh, we need a decent speed up, so something like about one simulated year per calendar day is something we need to aim at. And uh, to get the statistics right, you would do this as, as a rather large ensembles. And oops, that's clearly not possible today. The question is, will that be possible in the exascale, whatever exascale, whatever exascale means error, and what is possible today? So one point I would like to briefly go into is uh, the scalability problem. And I mean, we had lots of sessions and talks on climate, and it was always somehow mentioned that scalability is an issue, but uh, I have the experience that we really have to explain this again and again and again to the domain scientists and to the IT people what, what really the consequences of this, this scalability problem are. And I like to use a, uh, an example which is on the other side of the scale, which is not, one, not, 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 not very high resolution but very low resolution. This is from a project we are having in Germany which wants to uh, simulate with using a complex coupled Earth system model a full glacial cycle. So simulation time of 100,000 years. And to do this, we are really limited to very, very low resolution. So this is how we can represent Europe. And this is cutting edge science. So this is a very big German project uh, with very renowned scientists the steering committee from, from, uh, from all, over the, over, all over the world, so really the leading scientists in this field uh, support this project. And still, so that's, that's cap capability computing, but uh, if, even if we scale this as far as we can, we cannot fill it uh, with a single experiment, the machine we could fill with is at maximum 10, 10, uh, 10 teraflops, so far from petaflops even. And, uh, and the reason for this is, uh, of course, it's a strong scaling limit. So if, we, if, if this is our, our low resolution model, at some point in time, we do not have enough work left for a single processor or a single core. So we end up with this uh, maximum uh, number of years we can simulate. If we, if we go farther in scaling, use more of pit stein or whatsoever, we get even slower in time to solution. If we use more grid points, we can scale higher, but since the grid point distance is for numerical and consistency reasons coupled to the time step. We have to use a smaller time step, and then we get less work done. So if we go to 250 kilometers of resolution, we can only simulate 50,000 years. Within this one year or so, we have maximum for one experiment. And there's no way around that. I mean, even if we speed up the, the, the model by a factor of two or four, okay, we get Get, get this a bit up, but the, the fundamental problem that this will never be an exascale uh, problem uh, is the same. And uh, if we now go to our one kilometer thing, this uh, curve will be very flat. And I think, yeah, I have a, a slide here which I took from John Dennis from NCAR. So he 
basically the idea here was to, to uh, take the OM model, which is an atmosphere model, compare it to uh, its, uh, its, uh, its performance on several compute architectures, among them KNL, which, is a, which was at that time at least a promising architecture. And so he shows here several resolutions, which are still very coarse, 100, 25, 12. And here he shows the number of simulated years he can do. And remember, I said we need at least one simulated year for this cloud resolving thing. For, for real climate, for other climate applications, you need even more. So this here is marginal for climate. And this down here is a test with a one kilometer resolution, which is way too slow. And so the conclusion of John is basically you can speed up your models by a factor of two or four, but that's incremental to really reach that goal of one kilometer global. You need much more memory bandwidth and quite, quite a bit, bit, bit more flops. So doing just more of the same will not help you here. You won't get there. That's what John says. This is a bit more optimistic slide from uh, S.J. Lin from GSD, GFDL, who John came from the climate side. Uh, S.J. comes more from the weather prediction side, and he shows uh, a 50-hour prediction with a rather high resolution, three-kilometer global resolution uh, weather model. And his conclusion is, this is even today possible to reach the. Uh, so this is. Uh, 10 days in 36 or 8 minutes, so that's, if you do the math, that's one to several years per day with a three kilometer resolution atmosphere only model. And that's possible on, 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 uh, on today's model. So we are approaching uh, our, our goal from, from both sides. The last example from Japan. So these are really the, the most advanced uh, centers uh, trying to reach this one kilometer goal, or at least the cloud permitting several kilometer goal. Here, first of all, this shows that uh, climate modeling, Earth system modeling is really a driver for HPC. So these are the Japanese uh, top systems, which at one point in time have been the number one systems in the world. And we heard from the Chinese uh, speaker in the, in the first day that the K computer still outperforms the Chinese top one system when it comes to real applications. And here, for the first time, also, we see an approach for, for a coupled model, and but still, this is uh, the goal here is within the next year or so to go down to 14 kilometer resolution and about 10 or so in, in the ocean, and to simulate one year. And so, just one conclusion from from uh, uh, Hisashi, who would I would, would would like to highlight. So again, this. More of the same wouldn't work here. We need some ideas like DSLs or things which have been heavily discussed in the previous mini symposia, uh, for instance, on, on weather and climate here as well. So new, new ideas, re refactoring the, the codes, we start develop new codes. And just again, one slide from Pete, Peter. So these things have been shown in several talks. The Atlas library with abstracts, uh, the grid and the data layout from the user is within the escape project married to the Grid Tools library development at uh, the Grid Tools DSL developed here at, uh, at uh, CSCS and ETH uh, to kind of abstract the essential operations uh, away from, from the scientists and let the scientists uh, concentrate on its work. And also, of course, the hope is if these things are really maintained on a long scale, long time scale, uh, by computer scientists, though in this separation of concerns idea, then this would also help to increase portability and speed of the models. So conclusion, that weather and climate DSL development may well be the only solution for enable efficient scientific development and producing efficient portable codes, especially on the scales we are talking about here in this, in this mini symposium. Okay, changing, changing gears a bit. This is the European ecosystem, as shown by ETP for HPC, European Platform for High Performance, high performance Computing, and the European Commissions. So three pillars for, for this ecosystem. The HPC systems itself, so that's basically praise in this case. Uh, projects to develop new algorithms, new, new technologies, and what they call centers of excellence, uh, 
talk about this a bit more in a minute. And uh, so climate science and weather science, of course, has its place in, in all of these, these pillars, and we, we complement them. For instance, uh, uh, we are uh, many climate and weather research organizations purchase their own uh, HPC systems, which are this is the European, these are three Europe European ones, uh, the latest top 500 list. Is so, so three or four European climate and weather systems among the top 40 of the world in this list. And all these systems have been purchased a year or two ago. So, so but still in the actual list, they, they are uh, top machines. So there's quite some investments, two, 300 million euros for all these systems together, just because praise alone doesn't meet our requirements, is not uh, sufficient, uh, is not reliable, reliable enough to do, for instance, uh, operational things like weather forecasts. On the development part, again, very prominent example of one of the funded projects within this uh, triangle is the SK project. There are others which also are related to climate and weather. And of course, there's lots of national institutional funding. And within these centers of excellence, as they are called, are nine of them. Yesterday we learned in the, in the keynote that alone three of them, the public, public lecture, three of them are de dedicated to material science. We have one which I am coordinating which is on uh, climate and weather and bringing together climate and weather scientists in earth system modeling. We do have 16 partners, the three centers with the big machines I just showed, several other leading uh, climate research institutions, national weather services, and also three, uh, three vendors, European vendors, the Bull, High performance computing, Seagate, storage, Alinea software tools. Uh, Alinea, I think it's probably the wrong logo. They have been purchased by ARM currently. Uh, so, very high profile scientific institutions, but still, uh, I have to stress that this is just a project, and it's a project funded with four or five million euros. So, it's a rather small project, which is called a center of excellence, but I think we really have to think about how we want to go forward to develop from all these European contributions we have here a real center of excellence. Okay, within this Easy West project, so we look at uh, the three main bottlenecks of uh, Earth system modeling, which is scalability. I talked about that. Usability is about portability, performance portability, maintainability of the whole workflow, and exploitability is about data, huge amounts of data. And since it's or only just one project here, we concentrate on these global high resolution models to enable and, and push this, uh, what is done in other uh, continents, I uh, showed the example from Japan, where uh, advances also in Europe. Uh, we are, cannot do this alone in Germany, there are a few slides about uh, what the German partners are doing here. Uh, 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 German Climate Research Center, where I am coming from, Max Planck's Institute for Meteorology and the German Weather Service, are working with the ICON model, which is used for climate and weather. There's an ocean model as well, based on the uh, on ICON ocean version as well. We have our own Kepler, but it's, it's, it's a closed system. And uh, there's a big German project, which has much more funds than just this easy way project, which is called High Definition Cloud and Precip Precipitation for Climate Prediction. And within this project, we managed to scale this icon model to the full uh, Drew Queen machine in Jülich. That was the most number, uh, highest number, of course, we could hold of. So we are a member of this high Q club when we scale to at, uh, in the order of 500,000 cores. We did this with a local uh, area model with a resolution of 100 meters, and uh, just here, so we do production with this, but we can just simulate one day and five days elapsed time, so we need to go better. But there are other, other versions of this, this model as well for other regions. Uh, just, this, just a very short plot to show the, the level of detail you get with the 100 meter version, but that's not really what I want to talk about here. This is, again, what we saw on the first slide, so this 2.5 kilometer tropical Atlant Atlantic, and what is done here is a period is simulated 
Well, there's also an associated uh, observational comp campaign, so there's uh, really good data to, to validate uh, the model results. And uh, what we are doing, what I have done within the EasyWays project now, really funded through the EU, that we have extended this 25 kilometer simulation to, to a global simulation, uh, a global version, so we really can run as uh, GFDL, for instance, with the ICON model, 2.5 cloud, uh, kilometer cloud permitting resolution on, on a global scale. And uh, yeah, just one example, a satellite picture with same point in time from the model, though it looks quite similar. Uh, the plans, of course, are to go much, or to, to, to have this uh, scale up to one kilometer for for the ICON model, but also for the IFS model from ECMWF is in the project. And until the end of the first phase of this project, we hope we get a second phase also to have at least 10 kilometer coupled Earth system modeled based on ICON ocean atmosphere and on the EC Earth uh, uh, model, which is used by, by a number of institutions across Europe. Uh, we have some scalability curves for both models, for ICON and IFS. And here you, for instance, see, uh, what you see is, I have to admit, this is IFS at the point that at, at the moment is much faster than I can, so we have room to approve. But uh, one reason why IFS is faster here is that they also, within easy ways, really uh, systematically tested the, the concept of going from double resolution to single resolution uh, precision. Uh, from double precision to single precision, and that buys you a factor of at least two or so. Uh, and we did some extra extrapolation based on, on these numbers and also on the numbers which I got from the other institutions worldwide. And we think we can go, to, go, go down to about one kilometer global simulation using current technology if we have 10, 20, or 30 million cores available and if we can keep up the, the weak, weak scaling curve. So, in principle, I think it's doable with the desired uh, throughput as well. We might have some trouble with data, but Christoph will be talking about data in, in, in the last talk of this session. Okay, so looking into the future, what is our long-term strategy? I, I told you that there are several European uh, initiatives around this uh, system modeling thing. Uh, there's easy ways. The center of excellence, there is uh, the related project like Escape, there's also other things like Eurex are funded by, by the um, next gen IO, which is dealing with IO, many projects which, uh, which at least as use cases use climate modeling, even if they are not really centered to climate modeling. There are national in, in initi initiatives like this HTCB Square project, which I showed, uh, showed you. Uh, there is in Europe, there are two initiatives, one is uh, there will be probably a call for what they call extreme scale demonstrators, which will be a number of pre exascale systems funded with 20, 30, 40 to 50 million euro each within the next three or four years. There's a really new uh, initiative, which is called Euro uh, HBC Europe. I think Thomas knows much more about this than I do. And uh, so what we hope for is that we can use all this momentum to come up with something which has, which I call here an epic prototype, and so EPIC is something which, even, which is even above all this. It's a, it's a number of uh, leading domain scientists, but also uh, IT scientists. So Thomas Schultes is one of the driving forces, Bjorn Stevens is one of the driving forces, uh, to promote this development of uh, resolution, uh, one kilometer resolution global weather climate, but really makes a science case why we need that. And explain why we probably need a dedicated system to achieve this. Can I just go to praise and, and uh, ask for some allocation? And that, of course, would then be a real center of excellence. And uh, one, one way to implement it would be to go for a flagship project. One of, and at the first day, one of the uh, keynotes was about this uh, human brain flagship project. 120 partners, a lot of money. So I'm not sure if we, <laughs> if we want to do that and if this is the right instrument. Maybe not. But at least there is, is some momentum and uh, some, some drive to, uh, to somehow implement this. And, and I think the EasyWest Center of Excellence can, can, 
can play a role as a kind of, of, of nucleus here. Okay, so coming to the conclusion, so I think or we think that one kilometer global coupled Earth system models, also atmosphere, ocean, ice, several other components, would really advance climate and weather research by uh, somehow resolving the problems we are having with not knowing how clouds will form and where it will rain. It's not 100% clear yet if this is feasible. I mean, atmosphere only, ocean only, okay, but really one kilometer coupled modeling with a decent throughput remains to be seen. We're working it. Probably we have to change our models. By extrapolation, we think that it will be possible with in the order of 10 million cores. There's already 10 million core, core system existing in the world, so I think the hardware will be, be there, but then we still need to quite some speed up and just more of the same incremental uh, speed up of, uh, of single core performance of the models would probably not, uh, not help. So we need new, new, newer ideas like DSLs. Probably no single institution can do that, and uh, I think uh, well, we, we started to assess the comput computability and the bottlenecks, and uh, we hope we will be reach that goal, that vision of uh, of really a European project of accessing extreme scale climate with extreme scale computing will come true at one point in time. Okay, that's it, and then I can go to stop here before it's ringing. So, do you have any questions in mark to this introduction part? Thomas. I don't know the. I can't pronounce the acronym <laughs> HDCP2. HDCP uh, square. Yeah. <laughs> uh, project. What simulated years per day did you get on that? I'm not sure. I may have missed it on the slides. Uh, we got uh, a day per day or something like this. It's, uh, okay, so it's, it's, it was. It's, it's, it's just. And we just got it running, so we have to, to, okay. to tune that up. But uh, the extrapolation is that we get uh, 50 or so yeah. years per day if we really so can scale it, scale it to, the, to the strong scaling limit. I mean, we, we, just, we are just using 1,000 cores on our uh, uh, 30,000 cores, which is far away from the strong scaling limit. So that's um, then a, a, a second question. You mentioned the Atlas library and you referenced grid tools and uh, you, you made a point about the, you know, how long is the commitment mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. to these things. And, and I agree that's a valid concern. Um, but the, the way, you know, whenever you have efforts like this, you have to ask the question, what is the, uh, you know, how sustainable is the effort? Mm -hmm. And the, the question is really back to the community. Can you imagine that the community goes into a relationship with large centers like the PRAISE, mm -hmm. tier zero centers, and CSES is one, one of the examples, and uh, a, a vendor, vendors in a, in a form of consortium, uh, uh, because vendors may be interested in you know, if you have these tools like grid tools in the interface between grid tools and the, the back ends for the hardware, mm. the community has an, 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 uh, an interest in the interface above and, and somehow that there is a joint, uh, you know, like a consortium between multiple vendors, centers and the communi a particular community to maintain. Yeah. Uh, in a long term. I did diff definitely, I mean, that would... Yeah. That would, uh, would because be the, the idea behind this is that, you know, we spend so much money on investments and the, the, what we get for this money is becoming less and less satisfactory mm -hmm. in terms of the software stack. And so I want to push 
that we take some of the money we invest, and we've done it with PASC, for example, that we actually not invest into a vendor, but invest into some software development team. Yeah. But it cannot be an academic team because PhD students have other goals than producing software that, that is maintainable. You know, yeah. they have to produce papers and... For sure, that, I mean, that, 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 that would be the perfect solution. I think I'm always saying it boils down to the question for, for, for domain-specific languages, what is the domain? If, if the, the domain is large enough that, for instance, Stan is sitting down here, I don't know if, he, if he's listening, so uh, if somebody like NVIDIA sees a return of investment and sees that, that the, the user community of Gridwood, for instance, is well, large enough for them no, to, the to point invest... Is, is, uh, the point is that the domain may not be large enough for, and, and you may not want to have a particular vendor. I, I'm now taking okay. the point of view of the community, not of the vendor. They mm -hmm. have a different view. But you may not want to have a particular vendor to, okay. uh, uh, to own the domain. You want at least two, ideally more than two vendors, own, you know, be available to a domain. Mm -hmm. it, 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 so we have to go away from the thinking that the vendor does everything yeah. for you, whether it's Cray or NVIDIA or Intel or Pull. It, it has to be a, a consortium, and we have to just take the development of the software tools in our domain or in a domain uh, yeah. more at the professional level, which I know the weather services have been yeah. doing anyway, so yeah. I'm not trying yeah, to yeah, say... But, but, but that's, that's what I... Maybe that's, uh, that's a point I try to make that uh, with this uh, consortium we have with an easy way such as that, that there's, a, there's some interest in, in, in advancing this thing and that, that, that might be a new nucleus to, to, to bring this forward and we cannot be uh, dependent on third-party EU funding. This, this, this needs to be something which we really want to do and do all together. No, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. That's really the way they see it. So I hope, and if you have problems understanding it, I'm available the afternoon. It's very <laughs> important that we understand this properly. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree.